Good afternoon, and welcome to talks at Google. I'm Jeremy Stern with Google Fiber, and our guest today is Shal Shalwin Fullove. Shal's been a Googler for 13 years. She started at Google Search, moved on to a number of other products, and then became a Sloan Fellow at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, returned after her fellowship and worked on apps and business and Gmail, and then came to join Google Fiber about three years ago with me. And when she's not a full-time Googler, she is a full-time mom and a world-class runner and an endurance athlete. Let me share with you some examples of her uh, long list of accomplishments in running. Her personal record running a marathon is two hours, 41 minutes, and 57 seconds. Think about that. 26.2 miles in under two hours and 42 minutes. That was her personal record set in December at the California International uh, Marathon, and it was a key, key race getting her to this day, and so we'll talk more about that. She also ran a 1,500 meter a mile in under four minutes and 35 seconds in the U.S track and field Pacific Association Championships a few years ago. She's in Los Angeles today for the U.S. Women's Olympic tri Team Marathon Trials on the road to Rio in 2016. This is a really big race this Saturday for Shell, and we're really lucky to have her here. Please join me in welcoming Shell to Google Venice Beach, and also her, her husband, Ramsey, and daughter Elise and mom Marianne are in the audience with us, so welcome also to Google Venice Beach. <laughs> welcome. Um, it's been fun as a team, Google Fiber teammate of yours to follow uh, your path here, but I'm, I'm really excited to have you here and to share with the Google audience and the YouTube audience uh, a little bit more about you and your racing career. So can, can you tell us a little bit about, first of all, you're on the Google Fiber project. Tell, tell us a little bit about what Google Fiber is. So Google Fiber is high-speed internet and TV for your home or small business. Um, and it's a gig, which is a really big deal, right? Um, so it's a lot faster than probably most of us have, unfortunately, at our homes. And I've been on the team for about three years, like you mentioned earlier. So almost over 13 years at Google, um, what inspired you to move from uh, other projects to come join the Google Fiber team? What was interesting about the opportunity? I've worked on a lot of projects and products since I've been here. I think maybe more than 12 products. Um, and a lot of that is because at that time at Google, we were launching a lot of new products um, you know, in the early 2000s. So um, lucky to just be able to move on um, to new products as they were launching. Um, you know, after almost 10 years at Google, I really wanted, to, if I was going to continue to be here, I wanted to be working on something that was very um, audacious and um, a little bit scary, and launching a new fiber network seemed to kind of fit that description, right? So it's not, um, it's not an easy, easy project to, or problem to solve, and we're chipping away at it, and um, so I'm really excited. I've learned a ton about the TV business and internet and fiber. So um, it's really kept me excited to keep learning all the time. What do you do on the fiber team? So I sit on the business development team and I work in the strategy and operations. Um, I work closely with yourself and Irv and the content licensing team um, to better understand what we've signed up for on the deal side and help product and engineering understand um, how to build a roadmap around those obligations. So you're a full-time Googler, a full-time mom. How do you find time to be a world, how in the world do you find time to become a, a world-class marathoner? Well, it's certainly not just me. My husband is here, he's also a Googler. He's been at Google as long as I have, maybe a little longer. Um, it's definitely a team effort. There's a ton of people that help us get everything done every day. But it's certainly, the schedule is every day a game of Jenga about like who's gonna work out when, who's gonna take a week for school, what's dinner gonna be like. Um, we have help at home too, which is great. But um, we work together and um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of working out on the bookends of the day. But I do get a chance to work out at work a lot. There's a great group um, of mostly guys, the Mountain View Lunch Run group. 
Um, if they're not watching right now, it's probably because they're out on a run. Um, so sometimes I'm able to just get in some running during the, the work day. So the race to, to on Saturday, February 13th, to qualify for the U.S. Olympic team, um, it's Saturday in Los Angeles. Tell us a little bit about the Olympic qualifying process. Sure. So um, there's basically two standards that get set. The Olympic standard um, is set by the International Olympic Committee, and then individual countries have their own standard. So initially, the Olympic standard was 2.43, and for the U.S., we usually have a time that's um, equal to the Olympic standard. So if you've met the U.S. standard, then you automatically met the Olympic standard, and so you already have that. Um, at least for the marathon, it's a little bit different in track. So initially, the standard was 2.43, um, and I just missed the standard. I ran 2.43.33 in 2013, um, so just by, like, a little over a second a mile, I missed the standard, which was a little bit heartbreaking, but I wasn't, I ran a good race and I was happy about that. Um, and so then in 2015, I went and ran 241 and hit the 243 standard. And then two days later, my family and I are in Hawaii and the Olympic Committee announced that they changed the standard to two minutes slower. So they changed it to 245. Um, and which is great news for a lot of women because that meant they, ought, they just they'd just qualify for Olympic trials. Um, well, sorry, the Olympic Committee changed it to 245, and then the U.S. Committee, a couple days later, agreed to change it again to 245 to meet the Olympic standard. So um, it's a little bit unusual this year. So initially it was 243, now it's 245. Does that mean there'll be more women racing on Saturday? So I think um, something like eight new qualifiers were allowed to come into the race after they moved the standard back about two minutes. Um, which is great news, all in all. Um, and then on Saturday, the way it works is um, there's a little less than 200 people in the men's and women's race, and um, the top three finishers will be the U.S. Olympic team that goes to Rio, and the fourth place finisher will be the alternate. So it's a very democratic process. <laughs> yeah. What? Um, where is the race taking place on Saturday? It is down by um, LA Live. Um, it's a, a roughly a five loop course. Um, it was a two mile uh, loop to begin with and then we do four by six miles. So it's a very spectator friendly course. So it's different, the, the big LA marathon is Sunday right? and that's from Dodger Stadium to the sea. Right. Straight, not a straight line, but A to B. Right. This is a different, com completely different course than that. Yep, it's definitely set up for spectators um, to see a lot of us. And it's not even like a real loop, it's almost like an out and back. So. Um, we'll, we'll be able to see a lot of the spectators quite a bit, which is nice for such a long race. So have you studied the course? How, have you, how do you prepare for a particular race course when you're, when you're getting your game set, game mind going? Um, they've had really good interactive maps online, um, posted that a while ago. They didn't uh, finalize the course until not too long ago. Um, and they've had a couple t um, opportunities for you to come down and run the course with some officials. And I think I will probably try to do a couple shakeout runs on uh, Thursday and Friday. Step back and tell us about your journey to this incredible day. This isn't your first Olympic trial, right? Right, I qualified in 2008. So, you know, so t tell us about your prior efforts. You um, yep, so I qualified in 2008 and they were in Boston, which was really special. Um, I. In 2005, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and overcame that. Um, took about a year or so to come to overtake that, and it went really well. I had great doctors, but personally, I felt like I wanted to prove that I was like the same or better than I was before I got diagnosed with this horrible disease. And I decided I was going to pick some audacious goal to prove that I had come back stronger from that. And qualifying for the Olympic trials marathon was what I chose. Um, That's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> so I, um, it's a hard, it was a hard road. I, I had three attempts and I qualified just seven weeks before the actual Olympic trials in 2008 at the Napa Valley Marathon. So I had seven weeks to turn around and come back and um, it was a great day and to have it be in Boston, which is such a marathon mecca. Um, Joni Samuelson was in the race that year. I actually ended up running a lot of the race just ahead of her. Um, but Boston went crazy every time she came by, so I felt like I had support the whole time. And <laughs> every time we came down Boylston, because it was it was a, a four loop course, so we came down Boylston four times, and the crowds were just going crazy. It was the day before the Boston Marathon too, so 
it was a really great experience. And then I, um, I stepped out of 2012 because I was still on maternity leave, I had a little baby. And um, I decided, well, I wanted to go for it again. So eight years later, I, I decided to tackle it. What inspired you to do it? To do 2016? 2016. Um, I think you, you know, you did it one time, you kind of want to say, okay, was that, did I just get lucky, or was it just a fluke, do I still have it? I think, you know, the, cor the time was three minutes faster, and I was going to be eight years older, and I thought, that seems like a really hard goal. Another I should audacious just, goal. And I should just go <laughs> for it and see, I mean, there's, you know, sure, maybe I wouldn't get it, but maybe I'd get pretty close, and in 2013, I mean, I just missed it by 33 seconds, so I was like, I have to try again. So I, I was injured in 2014, um, and I actually t um, tore my hamstring in early 2015, so it's been, you know, there's definitely been some challenges along the way, but I just, I can be bullheaded at times when it's, uh, <laughs> when it's, you know, when it's helpful. So the race in December, it was Sacramento, is that where yep. it was, the California um, International Marathon. Your personal record, extraordinary result. Tell us a little bit about that race and the experience of what it was like for you. Sure, I was really nervous that week. The training had gone really well, um, but I was really nervous because the year, couple years before when I ran it, it was a really hard day. It was you know 27 degrees and I had all this you know, horrible memory of like, I mean, the last mile and a half, I was like losing my vision. I w it was just horrible. So I, you know, even though I was fit this time, you just think about how much it's going to hurt that last 5K. Um, but my friends were really supportive and keeping my spirits up. My coach was fantastic. Um, and basically, the gun went off, and you're just kind of out there. I mean, in full honesty, I was kind of grumpy the first 10 miles. I was like, it was rainy and it was dark and. I was just like, oh gosh, you know, it's crowded. All the water stops are crowded, and because um, all the we hadn't strung out yet, there were two pace groups, and we were all kind of just one at that time. But I remember at like 10k, I kind of was in the in a group, kind of settling in, and in chunks. So after the first 10 miles, like 11 to 15 is kind of the rolly part, and by that time, I'm like, well, I'm out here, so we're just gonna be out here and see what happens, and. 16 to 20, you get a nice little downhill, and I was feeling good at that point. Um, I just kept remembering my coach saying, get to 20 under control, because you can really open up that last 10K if you feel good. Um, and after 20, I just kept waiting for the, the wall. I kept thinking about two years before, where I just was like dying and like losing my vision, and like, <laughs> you know? But it never came, and it was, I couldn't believe it. And actually, my fastest mile was mile 26. I ran the 554 last mile, and I just was gunning it for home. And um, at mile 26, my, my, one of my best training partner friends was like, you got to go now. And I, I, mean, I had my garment on, and I knew I was averaging like 610, 611. And I was like, I think I got it. So but need I needed to run um, 613s or 612s. So we were at like 6.10 or 6.11 the whole time, and I had picked it up the last three miles. Um, but she was screaming at me like I didn't have it, and I had to run 400 meters. So I just started <laughs> running as hard as I could, which was great, because I dipped right under 242, which was great. That's extraordinary. Um, so to get to that level of being able to run you know, a 6.10, 6.11 pace for 26 miles, um, there's a lot of endurance athletes in, in, in this office and across Google. Um, tell us a little bit about your training regimen. What was it like and you know, how, you know, how did you set your training regimen up to hit that goal? Um, I have a, I, my coach is fantastic. Um, he's really a marathon specialist. Uh, his name's Michael McKeeman. And um, I've been training with him for about three years. And um, his training is very different than any training I did before. So in college, I was middle distance. I love the track, love my 400s, maybe some mile repeats. Um, his training is nothing like that. His training is a lot of tempo work, a lot of grindy, sit in it, like race simulation. So we, done a, we do a, t a ton of tempo. All of my long runs have um, marathon pace integrated into it. So the hardest long run I'll do is 22 miles, um, and the last um, eight to 10 are at marathon pace. So we do a lot of that work. So when the race comes, you feel very familiar with what is going on and you're tapered, so you feel great. 
So do you start out, I mean, how many, how many miles a week, you're six months out from the race, how many miles a week are you running? What so I am actually relatively low mileage for a marathoner. I never go over 75 miles a week, but my, all the work we do during the week is, um, is very high quality. Um, so I don't do a lot of double days. I do one double day a week and it's only three miles. Um, but I do a lot of tempo work. So, but all, all of the work is a progression. I'm so just doing the ma math in my mind. That's, that's more than 10 miles a day. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> get tired thinking about that. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of the women that I'll be racing against on Saturday, you know, they run 100 to 140 mile weeks. So, I mean, they have full time jobs to run. But um, I find that at 75 miles, things start to get a little frayed on the edges and I don't feel, you start to risk injury. So, um, we do a lot of high quality tempo work. Um, I told him after this race, whatever the next race we do, it has to require a lot of 400 repeats because I don't want to do a lot of tempo work for a while. Um, but it's always a progression, so I don't start at 22 miles. Um, and every other week we alternate. So if it's a, um, if it's not a tempo long run, we'll do it so that the last half is alternating, like an easy mile and race pace mile. Those are his easy long runs. Um, so. Yeah. What else besides running? Um, do you add any other uh, fitness into your program? I do um, a little bit of yoga and Pilates. Um, I have recently learned that my core needs a lot more work, so I've been trying to integrate a little bit more of that, um, especially after having a kid and um, just being a little bit older, you know, you really need to focus on that um, strong core. So what about diet? I mean, do you have a, uh, uh, a program for maintaining um, um, your metabolism and your physi physiology for, for maximum race performance? Mm -hmm. The one great thing about marathon training is uh, carbs. <laughs> you have to have a lot of carbs. Um, so good carb, there are good carbs and bad carbs. Yeah, when so you're marathon training though, it's just kind of all carbs, <laughs> you know? Like <laughs> you can eat all the stuff that they usually tell you not to eat because you're gonna burn it up and your body uses it as fuel. So um, I don't spend a ton of time like measuring food, but I just try to think generally to make sure I'm getting enough protein. I do, I do think a lot about what I eat immediately after the runs. I found that if after a really long hard workout or long run, if I am able to get a protein shake within um, 30 minutes of finishing, it goes a long way to helping me recover. Um, so what are some of the sacrifices along the way? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marathon, it's a long preparation course. What are some of the sacrifices that you have? Probably a better question for my family since they have to put up with <laughs> every weekend being a long run and uh, my husband bikes with me and he pulls the buggy with the lease and they like wait at the three mile mark for my water. And so their weekends are kind of taken up with mommy's running. Um, but you know, I, I don't know, I don't really see the sacrifices. I'm really focused on the goal. Um, I did, I, I, I had my 15 year Stanford reunion during this buildup. Um, so I had to miss a couple of the things there, but um, my roommates and teammates, they definitely understand they're so supportive. So um, I don't know, I don't really think about the sacrifices. I just think these are the things you have to do if you're gonna get your goal and um, so. What, um, um, one of the things you, you, you mentioned, you know, in, in the one of your races, uh, like almost losing your vision at the end, oh, yeah. there's an extraordinary amount of suffering and endurance uh, racing, whether it's, you know, open water swimming or running or biking or triathlon. Um, how do you prepare your mind for that? I mean. You know, a lot of endurance athletes that have written or spoken about the, the subject say it's, there's a huge part of the mind game mm -hmm. in terms of preparing. So tell us about that both in training and, ra and racing. Yep. Uh, the mental game is huge, definitely, especially when you're putting your body, pushing it, your body to its max. And um, I think one of the reasons why I was able to improve so much in the marathon over the last three years is the training that I was doing not only physically, where we obviously simulating the right systems and those long runs and those tempo efforts, but you're really getting your mind into that hurt zone where you're like, how am I gonna deal with this? And there were definitely, I mean, you know, lead, the night before these long runs, I'm like emailing my coach, I'm like, oh, I don't know, this seems 
You know, and after three weeks in a row of that, you're kind of like, God, I feel kind of burnt out. But I think mentally, it's training that mental muscle to get prepared for that. And I think, um, you know, sometimes you break it into smaller chunks. So like I did this year at CIM, it was like the first 10 miles and 11 to 15 and 15 to 20. So those little baby steps to get there. I think on Saturday, having it be a loop course, I'll be doing a lot of that, right? It's like, can I get the two mile loop? Can I get the first six mile loop? You know, just taking it one step at a time and really not trying to consume the whole 26 miles at once. Um, I think also having teammates and training partners is critical. Um, some of these workouts are almost impossible to do by yourself, but I've been really fortunate to loop in some, some Googlers, some, some of the guys on the MV Lunch Run, and um, some old teammates of mine from Stanford have been able to come out and help. Um, so it's, it's not one silver bullet to, to lock in the mental game, but um, I actually read the book Flow, um, this, this build up, up to CIM, which is really helpful to think about how to get in this flow state where you're kind of effortlessly like losing yourself in the moment and um, thinking about not pushing too hard, but trying to find some, some flow, some fluid, fluidity. So have you ever felt that flow in a race? I mean, because um, clearly there are barriers, physical and, and, and mental and weather um, how do you keep your, how do you, have you felt that flow and how do you keep yourself there? Um, yeah, I think sometimes it comes in spurts, especially in the marathon. I wasn't feeling any flow the first 10K to 10 miles at CIM. I was like, I'd rather be doing almost anything else right now than <laughs> like doing these first 10 miles. But um, yeah, like kind of in the middle, you start to kind of, your body starts to remember, you're, you realize you're here, you're gonna, you know, you're working with people, um, you realize you're getting closer. Um, I was holding back a little bit that last 10K because I was bracing myself for like the wall to hit me pretty hard. But then with the last 5K, I realized it wasn't coming and I really just needed to go for it. So I started to embrace it and, and really push. So, um, but th it's the truth is there's more races where you don't feel flow than when you do. So when you feel it, you really embrace it and, and try to enjoy it. Um, but more times than not, right, you're, you're grinding, right? It's hard, it's gonna hurt. So, um I guess the opposite of flow is is suffer. How do you? <laughs> <laughs> you're suffering at mile 15. What what wh what inspires you? And how do you? Because it's not just your legs and arms moving. It's your mind again, taking it back to the the mental game. How do you pull yourself out of that? Um, You've got to stay positive. Um, in the marathon, it's going to ebb and flow. Mile 15 could feel horrible, and then mile 16 and 17, you could feel like a million bucks, right? So I think you just really have to tell yourself this is going to pass. You know, you're going to, one of the things we do in yoga is like you notice when you're uncomfortable, okay, I'm going to acknowledge that I don't feel great, and then I'm going to let go of it, and I'm going to keep moving forward. Um, you just have to keep pressing and believing that, you know, you've trained for this, other people are suffering, we're working together, you know, just keep getting to the next mile, next mile. Um, but the reality is with running, it hurts. Racing hurts, and if it's not hurting, you're probably not doing it right. So you kind of just have to accept that it's gonna hurt, commit to it, um, and not, you know, if you can't run away from it. If you don't wanna hurt, like you probably shouldn't try to race and do running if you try to shoot something else. <laughs> I, I coach a high school team in Palo Alto, and we talk a lot about the pain cave. Um, what is the, the, the pain cave, right? It's like how the deeper you go into the pain cave, that's how you kind of, you know, in, reintroduce yourself to like new stimulus and new pain. And um, throughout the course of the season, we talk about how, you know, well, we've already gotten this far into the pain cave, so now this time we're going to try to go further. And by the time we get to the championship, we're going to commit ourselves to going the deepest we've ever been um, into that pain cave. So um, it works for the high school girls. I think they, they like it. What, um, um, has been the most challenging um, part of maintaining this level of performance for so long? I think I've been fortunate that it's been a, a, you know, if you mapped it, you know, broad strokes, it's been a really nice progression. So I came out of college being a middle distance runner. My coach, um, my marathon coach initially, we did a ton of track work. Um, so that felt like a natural progression. And then now I'm with, um, a new coach who does a lot of like marathon specific training. I don't think right out of college I could have jumped right into the training that I'm doing now. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to, to not have many injuries um, along the way. I've had a couple um, just in the last two years, but um, I've been able to overcome those as well. So um, it's been a natural progression. I love it. I have a ton of friends that do it. Um, 
you know, Stanford actually has um, upwards of nine or ten athletes that are going to be competing on Saturday. So it's been really great just after all this time to still have that camaraderie from the Stanford team. Um, do you have any words of wisdom for the endurance athletes here in this audience and uh, in, in uh, our TV audience um, on, on how, to, how to keep going, how to, how to keep inspired? Um, I don't know if I have a lot of words of, of um, wisdom or inspiration to share, but I think for me, you know, ha being surrounded by um, teammates and training partners is like the number one thing. Um, I run for an all-women's team. Uh, they're actually an apparel brand named Loiselle. We have the most women um, at the trials on Saturday. We have 18 women who qualified. Um, and being a part of that community has pushed me and helped me like reignite a fire for this, um, this sport that I've been doing since I was, I've been competing since I was five years old. Um, but it's been so amazing to be surrounded by so many women um, who are, you know, we have at least one woman who has a really good chance to, to make the team. She made the team in 2012. Um, to women who just run on the weekend and we all on social or at meetups, you know, support each other just, you know, equally, which is fantastic. Um, for me personally, having a coach is critical. Um, there's no way I could write a training plan and be a mom and work. And like, so having a coach that I can really trust, um, who's in invested in me and who I can just fully trust the process with is, um, is important. Um, what are the qualities that you look for in your coach? Um, it's funny, I found, so I was friends with um, Michael McKeema, who's my coach. I was friends with him from an, another training partner of mine, and I literally was wishing him happy birthday on Facebook on his wall, and then realized that he was also coaching, and I just said, will you coach me? <laughs> and he was like, sure. But, I mean, he has, you know, amazing experience. He, um, he actually uh, was Dina Caster's training partner for many years at the Mammoth, and she's an American record holder, so he spent a ton of time um, learning from some of the best marathon coaches um, in, in the U.S. So, you know, someone who just has a ton of experience, someone who understands me as a whole person, not just the athlete. I think sometimes it's easy to, for coaches to just think about you as the athlete, but he respects that. I work full time, that I um, have parental duties, um, but that I'm also, you know, but he doesn't let me back down from trying to go for these really big audacious goals. So he doesn't hold back my workouts, you know, just because I work and be a mom, which is great. What's your favorite workout? Um, I love quarters, which I don't get to do very much when I'm doing marathon training, um, but, um, the, the best workout leading into this, the marathon, we do, we build up to a 12 mile tempo run where the first 400 of every mile is at about 10K pace and then the last 1200 is at marathon pace. And what's awesome about that is it breaks it up. So you really, you kind of start to think about, oh, I'm just doing 400s with a 1200 meter recovery. Um, but you end up running 12 mile. I think I did this two weeks before the race and I did 12 miles at um, 605 pace in practice. Um, I actually did it at Google with, uh, with Matt Cook, who's a fellow Googler. And um, when, you, when you nail that workout, you feel really good. You're like, I, could, I emailed my coach. I said, I can't believe I just did that workout. You know, and you knew you were ready to, to race. So. Before I uh, open the floor up for questions from the audience, um, let me ask you some, um, some fun questions. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about, about diet. Sounds kind of flexible, but did you ever cheat on your your diet in 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 the lead up to this big big race? Um, I think around Thanksgiving and my birthday, I think we we went up to Napa to celebrate, and I think maybe I had a little more wine than I normally <laughs> would. Got to stay hydrated, so I try not to drink too much wine while I'm building up. But um, I'm a big believer in treating yourself. So um, yeah, after big workouts, I. Like every weekend, I go to the same restaurant and get a big stack of pancakes and butter and syrup and all that stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't I don't cheat too much. So what's your favorite what's your favorite food after after finishing race? Where are you going to go after 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 this race? That's such a popular question. Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite restaurants in LA is Rustic Canyon, and they have um, or they at least used to have 
um, a great burger. It's not on the menu, but if you ask for it, they have it, and it's delicious. And I booked that reservation like the day after I qualified. So we're going to Rustic Canyon on Saturday night. Um, tell us about your funniest race or training experience. If there can be a funny <laughs> race or training experience in a marathon. Um, two th I don't know if it's funny, but in 2008, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, in, in, um, in Boston at the trials, I was running basically just a couple meters ahead of Joni Samuelson the whole way. Um, and I thought, oh, maybe, I don't know what I was thinking, like, of course she's going to just be as strong as nails and beat her the whole time. But she just kept, be she kept being there. And it came down to like the last 400 meters and we're down Boylston and the crowd is going crazy. There's a giant screen on the, on the road and I can like I look up and I can see her like behind me and she's just crushing like the last 200 meters. I had to run a 38 second last 200 meters just to not get caught by Joni who I think broke the 50 year old um, age group record that day. So I remember just running for my life, trying to not, <laughs> you know, my mind, I'm like, I'm going to be a gold medalist in the marathon. But obviously that was not real, but um, <laughs> that, that really did happen. I have awesome photos from the Jumbotron on Boylston for that. That's pretty cool. So um, let me turn it over to the audience. Uh, um, anybody have any questions for Shal? Please join us at the microphone. After you do a race, what do you do? I mean, do you run it? What's your schedule like, and how long does it take to recover and everything? Yeah. Um, I usually take about a month where I'm doing just almost nothing or very unstructured um, work. Uh, I usually like to go to Hawaii right after marathons. I don't like to run in Hawaii, so I like to go like the week afterwards, and we just kind of veg out. So we actually did that after CIM this year. I went for a week and just hung out on the beach. And then um, the next three weeks are just very unstructured, staying loose. And then it's a very gradual buildup again. You don't hit it very hard, um, probably for another few weeks. Um, this time was a little bit different and for 08 too, because I had seven weeks between 08 and the trials, and this week, this time I had 10. Um, so we didn't have as much downtime as we wanted to. So you mentioned like some of the Olympic trials seem to take place the day before one of the large marathons. Right. So is there some reason other than avoiding the crowds that they just don't? do the trials on the regular course? I think that um, I think that it's just more spectator friendly to have loops. There may be um, a rule, some kind of um, international standard rule where that they do it that way for some reason. But I think um, having it the day before a big race like Boston or LA, it, it helps bring a lot of the fan base out. Um, there's, we get huge support. Um, I mean, I suppose they could. I mean, but those races are quite large, right? We're talking like thirty to 50,000 people, um, and there's only going to be 200 people in this race. So um, it's nice that they, like, kind of create it as a special kind of celebration for people going for the Olympic team. Hi. Um, do you have a story of how your training or um, how running uh, the marathons has um, – helped you like develop uh, professionally? Sure, um, I can grab that for a second. I think, um, you know, a lot of the qualities that you develop as an athlete, especially being an athlete your whole life, are things that transfer well into other parts of your life. So even before I was a working professional, right, being like a student athlete, right, your dedication, your ability to um, stay focused on the goal even when it's, things aren't going perfectly or you're kind of in that mid spot where it's kind of grindy and it's not always the most fun. Um, I mean, I think also being an athlete, every time you race, there's an opportunity to win, but there's also an opportunity to lose. And how do you deal with failure and, and learn from that and, you know, get up again and go. And so I think, you know, with Google, we, we push really hard. We want to fail fast, learn, iterate. And I think um, being an athlete, like, that transfers over, that's very relatable to me. It wasn't something that was new to me when I came to Google, right? I've been doing that since I was five years old. Um, so I think those elements of being an athlete transfer really well into your professional life. Please. I'll ask more than one question. Uh, do you have a favorite marathon course? I've only, uh, I think I've run six marathons. I haven't run that many. Um, 
I guess I've run Cal International the most, um, and it's been the most friendly to me, so I think that's probably my favorite right now. Um, it's close to my house, and it's fast, and they do a great job organizing it, but um, I haven't run that many, so uh, I run that one the most, so I would guess I would go with Cal International. If anybody's thinking about doing a marathon, it's a fantastic marathon. They do a great job. It's small, well organized, and it's fast. Sean, do you have any advice for people who have never done any exercise in their life but started <laughs> doing some <laughs> running in their 30s or 40s for the first time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would recommend getting together with a group. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be someone who has like a dedicated coach or anything, but there's so many good running communities to just motivate you and help you to learn so that you can kind of go at your own pace um, and have fun with it. Um, I think if it's not fun, you won't stick with it. And um, the pain part isn't so much fun all the time, but it is often the most rewarding. So you'll, you'll have a team around you to help you get through that and push. Um, so I would recommend trying to find a, a local community group or even just um, weekly runs at, at shoe stores often are very um, helpful ways to get started. Hi, Irv. <coughs> Did you uh, race it on the, any other distances competitively, and then what made you transition to start doing the marathon for yep. the side events? Yeah, I, um, I started running middle distance. Um, what, what is middle distance? A middle distance is, so when I was in college, it was the 1500 and 3K. Um, that was before they had the 3K steeple for women. So now they have the 3K steeple, and then it's the 1500 and the 5K is typically middle distance. Um, I think I always really wanted to be a miler. A mile was such a great distance. Um, but I think, um, you know, when I ran my first marathon, I just wanted to tackle something that I hadn't done before, so there was no precedent, you know, comparison point. The marathon seems big, you know, if you can do that, you feel like even if it wasn't like an awesome time, like you ran a full marathon, so that's great. Um, I think if you watch a lot of the people who are racing on Saturday, you know, it eventually everyone arrives at the marathon. Like eventually they just keep moving up in distance, right? If you're a 400 meter runner in high school, you're gonna run the eight and 15 in college, and then after college, you're gonna run, you know, the five and the 10, and so. Um, so in some ways you kind of always end up in the marathon, but for me it was just more of like, can I really do this? You know, my, my training for the first marathon was definitely more middle distance training. I thought three by a mile was like, you know, the big workout. So I survived that marathon, but I learned that that really wasn't marathon training. What, um, um, when you were, um, well, what's your fastest mile time ever? you were doing? Uh, I think I've run uh, the equivalent of like 452, which isn't, you know, for a miler is not amazing, but for me it was 452. Maybe that was also a reason why I decided to go back to the marathon. I realized the mile really wasn't working out for me. It really <laughs> wasn't, didn't have that turnover. As much as I loved overtraining for it, it really wasn't working out. So, um, I remember us talking about this um, in terms of motivation getting ready um, and you said to me once that there's nothing like putting a race on calendar to get you motivated to train true so um, when you decided to go for it in 2016 mm -hmm. um, what was what were the key dates for your so for, for your thinking yep so I, um, I had an injury in April, May. I actually had a torn hamstring, which is one of the like worst runner injuries you could probably ask for. So um, we had that as a starting point. I actually had um, PRP to help that repair. And so we knew that that was gonna be eight to 12 weeks until I could start training again. And then we needed X amount of time for a buildup. So we were looking at a fall marathon um, so there were maybe three marathons that we looked at. Um, we thought about Chicago, which was kind of early, maybe Philadelphia, which is really close to CIM. Um, and we just thought, give us a little bit extra time in case we missed a couple weeks of training. And it, CIM is so close to my house. So um, it was actually pretty straightforward to try to figure out because we had some pretty locked in um, time frames based on the injury that we had to work with.
thanks for the celebration in Hawaii and rustic canyon. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what are some of the rituals that you go through the morning of? It's game day, or like right yeah. the moments before you start. Like, what are some of the things that you need to do to get you in that mindset? Mm -hmm. um, this time around, I've spent a lot of time journaling. I record a lot of my training on Strava online, which is great for visual, but I've been spending a lot of time in my um, Believe uh, journal, where I write down a lot of the qualitative aspects and write letters to myself. And um, I was really nervous going into CIM, so I have like a couple page letter where I was just like, you know, talking to myself, telling myself to believe. Um, I spend a lot of time going back and looking at the workouts that I've done to just remember all the work that you've done and that you know you've actually prepared for this moment and you're ready. Um, other than that, there's a lot of carbo loading, especially as you get like closer to three days out, which is fun. So I try to like constantly be eating carbs to the point where like it gets a race day and you're like, I don't want any more carbs. I don't want anything that looks like a carb or tastes chewy or anything. Um, but the journaling and the reflection and that um, piece is a really important part. That's just the mental game. There's nothing else to do physically. Um, you can only do harm at that point. So. So on race day, Saturday, you wake up. What time is the race, by the way? Uh, the women's race, I think, is at 10:22. So a little bit later than you would normally have for a marathon. Um, and you guys are having some some hot weather hour. right now. So I think the men go at 10 and the women go at 10:22. Um, so. At least I get to sleep in and like kind of wake up at a decent hour and have some breakfast and digestion and all that. Please, any other questions for Shao? So actually, I have uh, two questions. Um, since your mom is here, I want to know that you run really fast. Uh, I mean, I cannot even think about running uh, one mile at four. Uh, Four, four minutes. I want to know whether you think this is coming from Jean or this is coming from <laughs> 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 your mom run marathon too? <laughs> I come from a very athletic family, um, but almost everyone in my family was, were basketball players. So both my parents played basketball in college. My brother was a very successful basketball player at UCSD. Um, I think my mom started to run track um, in college a little bit. Um, she ran a bunch after when I was growing up, which was hugely influential. I actually thought the long jump hit was a sandbox for the kids whose parents were running on the track, <laughs> just up top, and I went to the track, and I would just go sit and long jump hit and play. Um, so certainly, I think genetics, for sure, definitely. My parents are very athletic. So besides uh, marathon, do you run other professional sports, like, as you said, uh, middle distance, 5K, 10K? Um, the last couple of years have been focused on the marathon, but I'm looking forward to, to running some uh, personal uh, bests and some shorter distances like the 5K and the 10K. I've dabbled in the track a little bit, but all the track races right now are college, and I just feel like I feel like an old lady out there with all those college athletes. So I don't know. I'm going to probably stick to the roads. How many times have you been to the track? Oh, before? I'm saying like, um, like when you, when you were in college, high school, did you run other professional sports? Like I did grow up playing on different sports. I, I dabbled in soccer a little bit. That didn't last super long. Um, I played uh, basketball in high school for a couple of years. Um, I swam as an age group when I was really little, um, kind of before high school. Um, but I've done running most consistently. Um, I started, I put on my first uniform when I was five or six years old. Susanna? I have a long-standing prejudice. Whenever I hear a marathoner, I think that person is crazy. <laughs> so far, you have gone quite a ways to dispel that notion, but, but I'm still a little bit suspicious. Can oh. you please explain it to me? How are you not crazy? Uh, I never said I wasn't crazy. And I, I, um, I actually was having this conversation with somebody in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, my crazy comes out the closer we get to the race. You can talk to my husband maybe after the talk. And see how crazy I get. It, it took me about a zillion hours to pack last night to think about all the things we had to do. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there definitely are differs a bandwidth of crazy, um, probably, um, amongst all of us runners. But um, 
don't know. I mean, there's a little crazy, right? There's a little crazy to go out there and try to do this and to like put yourself through much, so much pain. But um, I don't know. I think I've been in the sport a really long time. Very fortunate for that, and I think you learn to, you know, enjoy the ups and downs, and if you really be focused on the long. I mean, I want to be running well beyond Saturday. Um, I want to be running when I'm much older. I want to, you know, um, I want to set a good example for the athletes that I coach. Um, so you, th you think about all those things when my daughter is going to be out there. I want to set a good example for that. So um, that helps make sure that you kind of check yourself on how you're approaching things. And um, I also have a great group around me, coaches and doctors and teammates, who um, I can easily sound board. Yeah, so uh, you said when you ran your first marathon that it maybe didn't go quite as well as you had hoped. And uh, at least my experience when you start getting into s like different sports or into a different um, aspect of that sport is you meet people who are much better. And so how, do you, how did you go from like, oh, I did this and I didn't quite do as well as I wanted to to like really being you know at the elite level that you're at right now? Um. I've been lucky to um, s some of the, some of my teammates now. We've been teammates since you know, for gosh almost twenty years, um, and I've been lucky to to be in the store a long time. So um, I think anytime you try a new distance, right, you're going to open yourself up to a lot of learning. We'll call it learning. Um, but um, I think. You know, you, you learn from that, and you, then you, you you meet people, like you said, and you talk to them, and you try to, to learn about that new distance or that new um, part of the sport that you're, you're trying to get after. Um, but I've been really lucky to be in the sport with some of the best um, for a very long time. Um, my, my time at Stanford, I, I am just so honored to be um, included in that list of alumni. You know, you've spent uh, a lot of time preparing for the marathon, and you know, this time around, the weather isn't the most optimal, shall we say, for <laughs> running a marathon, or you know, sometime around maybe you're not feeling well. Or so, how do you adjust your expectations after months of training for a, an exceptional goal, and then maybe everything isn't as conducive as you might want it to be otherwise? Yeah, the weather is always a factor in the marathon, and it's always something we have zero control on. So um, we try not to think too much about it, and then we just try to deal with the circumstances that we're given. Um, this time around for Saturday, for me, it's been um, a bit of an unconventional buildup because we've had a short buildup. It's only been 10 weeks since my last marathon. Um, I've had a, a small injury that's come up the last three weeks that we've had to really change the training around to accommodate. Um, and then we have this big wrinkle that it's going to be in the 80s um, on Saturday, right? So um, we've done a lot of recalibrating and, um, you know, at some point you can have a game plan. You can have your A, B, and C goals, um, but in the day you get out there and you have to trust yourself. That was the advice my coach gave me. Um, I was just talking yesterday about, you know, this is why we do a lot of unstructured runs, right? You have to know how your body feels and trust that you know what you can do and just to run within yourself. How have you felt in all this preparation and how far has it taken you away from your normal kind of like routine with your family? Mm. Um, there's definitely been moments I've been really lucky to be able to do a lot of racing close to home and to have such great, great, great training grounds really close to my house. Um, and um, some of the best doctors and physios um, are in our neighborhood, so that's been awesome. Um, Google actually has been really supportive. So the last couple summers, we've actually been able to go to the Boulder office for an extended stay and work a little bit from the Boulder office and train at altitude. So I've been really fortunate to be able to take my family. Um, at least it's not quite school age yet, so we're able to spend a lot of time uh, not having a real school schedule. Um, so that's been fantastic. Um, I did have this injury come up a little bit in the last three weeks where I've had to do a little bit more travel to go see some specialists about that. And um, luckily they've just been extremely supportive and we just try to make it as um, efficient as possible to go down there and do the work and come back. Um, work's been extremely accommodating as well. One of the, the things, um we learn both in, in, in work and athletics is envisioning an outcome. So what do you, what do you envision for uh, on Saturday at the finish line? 
Uh, are you thinking about it or? I am thinking about it. This is, um, I feel a little bit like I'm, I need to crystallize that over the next 72 hours, definitely, maybe 48 hours. Um, I, it was a little bit, it's been an unconventional buildup. I was, I've, you know, this injury's been a little bit of a wrinkle. The heat's gonna be a factor. Um, I think ultimately where I'll land is I'm gonna try not to overthink it. I'm gonna get out there and run really smart um, and not forget to enjoy it because this is quite, um, quite a moment that won't come again until, uh, maybe never again, but it's not gonna come before four years from now. Um, so I need to spend some time in my journal and um, around my teammates as well, get into town tomorrow. Um, and that'll probably help me start to think about it and feel a little good about it. Well, Shal, uh, on behalf of everyone at Google, we wish you the best of luck on, in this race, yeah. extraordinary opportunity on the road to Rio. And um, thank you so much for thank joining you. us on Talks at Google and uh, um, wishing you the best of luck. So thank you so much. Thank you. Very Thanks. exciting.